yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fed with the church a few times. Now nuts trying to give me head. Number one in databases and number one in mass shootings. It's not, it's, it's not a good, good mix. All right. So let's look at query optimizers, the second part. Um, so again, the, the, for, for everyone, again, reminder, this Saturday, so today's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, this Saturday, submit your uh, first draft of the DBDBIO encyclopedia entry uh, using the Google form. I'll give you feedback a week, a week later, uh, you know, uh, what to fix, whatever you need help with. Um, and then the, the, again, I, I changed the schedule, so the, the, status, the presentation for your status update of the, about Project 3, that'll be next Wednesday, not next Monday. Monday will be a lecture on cost models, and then everyone will present on Wednesday. And we'll, go in the, and we'll go in the opposite order that we went last time, okay? And if you, again, you want, you want to talk about Project 2, please, uh, Project 3, or uh, any of them, just please contact me. Is yes? Is there a design document for the, for the project for this? For two or three. So for, uh, I think so, yes. There's, there should be a, a markdown file. I'll post, I'll post that on Piazza. All right. So again, what are we doing? What, what are we talking about? Well, we're in this world talking about uh, query optimizers. Um, and the, you know, we, we talked about it last time, like we, we need to find a, a correct plan that has the lowest cost. This is super hard because we're trying to figure out all these different join orders, all these different transformations we, we could consider. And the, the end of the day, what the database system is going to try to do is use some, some way to cut down the search base so we're not doing an exhaustive search. Uh, and that gets us close to what, would be, what is potentially the real optimal plan. In some cases, we can short circuit. We, we know that the, we, we can generate uh, the optimal plan right away without doing any, you know, any, any, sort of any search considerations. But in most cases, especially in OLAP world, that's not the case. So we're trying to cut things down to get us to a, a good plan more quickly. And so last class, we spent a lot of time, or we spent the time going through the history of different uh, implementations, again, starting from the very beginning, from the 19, uh, in the 1970s, where people wrote rules, they wrote heuristics, describing, you know, here's how the transformations I, I want to apply based on, you know, s some domain knowledge that, that the developers would implement. Then also, too, in the 1970s, IBM implemented the first uh, cost-based search, uh, uh, cost-based joint search algorithm um, using, using dynamic programming to do, uh, to, you know, define an optimal plan or near optimal plan for, uh, for system R. And then, as I said, this is what most systems are going to implement today. There'll be a bunch of hard-coded rules uh, written in procedural language. Then you, you do some initial transformations, like, you know, always do a predicate push down and so forth. And then you do the cost bane search. And there might be initial steps afterwards to clean things up, like Postgres does. We talked about how to do randomized search algorithms, so simulated annealing or Postgres's uh, genetic, genetic algorithm. But the one we want to focus on in this class is stratified search and unified search, where there's going to be a, um, there'll be an optimizer generator, where instead of writing in procedural code uh, the rules and transformations we want to do, we're going to write it potentially in a higher level language. Now, in SQL Server, that won't be the case. They're, they're going to write everything in C++. But the original idea was you would write in this high level language, and then you, then you co-gen the, the, the compiler rules and the tr compiler transformations to do your query optimizer. And in the stratified search, you would have sort of heuristic-based rules followed by the, the cost-based search. And the unified search is that it's a single platform that's doing, uh, that's doing all the transformations. Now, again, I had you guys uh, watch the Microsoft video instead of, the, um, instead of read the, one of the Cascades papers. And as I was saying before the, the, the class started, I, when I watched it again last night, I realized, oh, yeah, this is a bit advanced for people that maybe never see Cascades before. They start talking about things like the memo table, and groups, and expressions. We'll cover those uh, in a second. Um, the Cox DB one is probably a, a better introduction to Cascades. But the, one of the things that they said in the Microsoft video is, even though the original Cascades paper and the Volcano paper talked about you write these things in a DSL, CockroachDB does that for the transformation rules, they're going to write everything in C++. Furthermore, they also talk about how they have these different stages uh, in their optimization pipeline where some of them don't even use the cost model. Right? Some of them, are, again, these transformations you're always going to want to do. You don't even consider, you know, fire up the search, search engine to figure this out. And so the lines get blurry now in a, in a real implementation because you're essentially doing this in multiple stages, not like one or the other. So in a modern implementations, these things, uh, 
they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're distinguishable. So in the case of you know, the cockroach DB stuff the, and the way the, uh, the SQL Server implements it. But if you, again, you read the original papers, it seems very much there's, there's this dichotomy between the two. So this I've already said, we can skip this. This is just a reiteration. Again, the stratified search, you have a bunch of rules, then you do cost-based search. Unified search is that you do all the transformations together, either logical to logical, logical to physical. And stratified search would, would just be logical to logical first, and then the cost-based search would do logical to physical. Whereas unified search, you can do everything all at once. And we'll see when we talk about cascades, because you're trying to do everything together, uh, you may have to do backtracking in, in the search algorithm. Like you're sort of expanding out the tree. So to avoid redundant computations, we're gonna, they're going to make heavy use of memorization to record the, 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 the expressions or exp uh, to, to record the, the cost of things they've looked at in the past so that they revisit something they don't have to compute it from scratch. And the big distinction of all of this is going to be the top down versus bottom up. Top down is going to be, going to be cascades. Again, that's where we start with this is, the, this is the end result of the query that we want. And then we expand down during branch and bound search. We expand out the nodes, the other operators, either logical to logical, logical to physical, to convert it into the, the physical plan that will get us to our end result. Where in bottom up optimization, it's, you start with nothing and you build this up. So this is essentially how describing how we're going to do enumeration and, and do exploration of the different possibilities we have in our, in our query plan. The literature, the research literature, according to the Germans, says this is better. But, it, but the paper you'll read next class is going to talk about how Microsoft has the best optimizer. And they're, they're doing this. So it, it, I'm, I'm biased to, to the, the Cascades approach, the top-down approach. The Germans love bottoms up. I think they're better programmers than me, so they might be, they might be right. All right, so today's class, we're going to talk about quickly uh, how to do logical query optimization. So you can think of this as like the, the in this pipeline uh, that we're talking about, it could be in the stratified search, it could be the transformations we're doing without having to consider a cost model, right, things you, you always want to do, to, you know, sort of putting the, the, the query plan into a canonical form. Then we'll talk about cascades and go into more detail of like what, how the, the, the different components work together. Um, and you know, how you actually do the traversal. And then we'll finish up doing sort of a quick uh, drive-by of some real-world implementations, both either going bottoms up and, and tops down. OK? All right, so in the first step here for logical query optimization, the idea is that we want to just do pattern matching on our uh, query plan to convert the, the, the logical query plan into another logical plan that will get us sort of closer to what we think the, the, the optimal plan will be. And this is us applying, us as being the database, database system developers, applying domain knowledge, what we know about the relational model, relational algebra, SQL, and, and the databases to put us closer to what, what will be the optimal plan. Rather than sort of being you know, blindly ignorant, starting from nothing, uh, we, we, we can sort of nudge it in the right direction and get us closer, you know, get, get, help, us, help us increase the likelihood that we will, we will find the optimal plan. So at this step, these, these, uh, these transformation rules we're going to apply can all, can't compare whether one, is better than, one sort of plan is better than another. Uh, it, it really is like rules where you always want to do this. Like, for example, where 1 equals 2, we always know that's gonna, that 1 is never going to equal 2, therefore that turns to false. And therefore, we should not do a scan. Like, you know, convert the plan to like a no-op or something like that. Right? You may laugh and think, OK, who writes 1 equals 2? People write stupid queries. Right? Like, so these things show up, and we have to account for this. Right? So again, so these transformations are, are sort of, they can be written in the unified language, or it can be written as any other transformation rule that we would use for cost, when we do cost-based search. But we know we, we're just always applying, pl applying them. So I'm going to go through an example here that actually comes from the Germans. Uh, we're going to take a query that is doing a bunch of joins, and we can show how if we just go from sort of the, the, the exact translation of the SQL query to relational algebra, uh, you know, that's going to be inefficient. But then we can apply these transformation rules to put, again, put the, 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 the query plan, the logical query plan, into a, a canonical form. OK? So we're going to show uh, four different examples, or four different, four different transformations we're going to want to do. 
So the query is the same one as we had before. We have three tables, artist, appears, and album. And we want to do a join to find everybody on my, now my OG remix, so my drill remix. So in the first step here, we're going to want to uh, decompose all the predicates uh, into their simplest form to make it easier for the optimizer to now move them around to do predicate pushdown. So again, we have this where clause like this, where we have three predicates. And so if you just convert this directly from the SQL statement or the parse tree into relational algebra or a logical plan, you would have a single filter operator with all the conjunctive clauses in, in the predicate. So in this case here, you simply just break them up ba based on the ands, and you have three separate filter nows, three separate filter operators, which each is the predicate that corresponds to you know, some portion of the where clause. And then now you can again now apply a rule that, that, that doesn't match that you have a filter above a scan on a table with something in between. In this case here, we're doing join, but it's denoting with a Cartesian product for now. We'll get rid of that later. But in this case here, I would have a rule that says, I see a scan on album.name, but it's above a join of some type, uh, which, is, you know, which is above the scan on the album. So therefore, I obviously want to push this, that predicate down. right? So you can do the same thing for, for artists. It's right above the join here. Right? Again, that, we don't need a cost model to know this. We, we, we know as humans in working with data systems, the, the sooner you throw away data in your query, the better the query is going to run. All right, so the next thing is we obviously want to get rid of the Cartesian products. Right? So what is this doing? Artists and appears. This is taking all combinations of artists and, 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 and peers and making you know, the massive set of tuples. And then we apply the filter that says artist ID equals, equals appears that artist ID. So instead, if we have this filter, we know that as we're computing the join, instead of you know, materializing tuples that are never going to get past this filter anyway, we convert this into an inner join. And, and same with the other one. Again, no cost model. We know we want to do this. All right, and then the last one is a bit more nuanced, and this isn't always the case. It depends on the system. Um, but we can, do, we can do projection push down. So again, I'm not sharing the schema, but assume the artist appears in an album table. They're, they're really wide. They have you know, maybe dozens or hundreds of, of columns. But at the end of the day, the only thing I care about in my query is getting back artist.name. So in that case, I want to do push down the projections so that I throw away the unused columns uh, at lower parts in the query plan. Right? So in this case here, I'm putting the projection above the the filter because I obviously need album.name uh, for this. So again, we, so now we have a query plan that has more operators than we had before, but it's closer to what we actually would want to execute anyway. Right? And in this example here, the, the join order is going to matter a lot, but I just went, you know, for this example, I didn't, since I don't have a cost model this step, I just say, okay, I'm going to join them in the order that they appear in the SQL query. Right, that was that semantic optimizer thing that, that Oracle claimed was amazing uh, that we talked about last class. But again, at this point, it's just a logical plan. That's OK. So now we have a logical plan. Uh, we can't execute this. We, we, need some, we need a physical plan that's going to tell us, here's the exact algorithms I'm, I'm going to want to run to do these different operators. Right, so back here, I have artist appears in album. It, I'm not saying it's a sequential scan. I'm saying, not saying it's an index scan. I'm not saying you know, how I'm actually getting this data. Same for the joins. I didn't say what join algorithm I'm actually using. So now we need to convert the, the, the logical operators into physical operators because we can then either execute that in, the, in our system, in our, in our execution engine, or we could cogen it into some plan and, and run that. Right? So the, to do this, now we're actually have to gonna, we need a cost model because we need to know what's going to do uh, you know, of the different choices we could have for physical operators for a given logical operator, we need a way to say this one's going to be better than this other one. And this is where the cost model comes, comes into play. So we'll spend more time talking about this on Monday next week uh, when, we talk, when you read the paper from, 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 the, from the Germans. But we, kinda, we can't avoid it at this point. Right? There's, there's some cost model that's going to be able to tell us this physical operator is better than another based on cardinality estimates, based on hardware information, based on something that it knows about, about the system. For now, we'll, we'll assume that it's perfect. We'll see next class that it, 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 it never is. 
So before we get into the different enumeration techniques, I just want to point out that everything we've talked about so far in this class, we've assumed that the queries are, are somewhat simple, meaning uh, the, you know, there are always equijoins or inner joins. There are always predicates that are they're, they're just always sort of looking at just two tables at a time. Um, and there's no, obviously no, no Cartesian products. We talked about lateral joins when we talked about the UDS. That was the first sort of, sort of complicated scenario or complicated queries that appear in the real world. Other issues are going to be mostly with joins, outer joins, semi-joins, and anti-joins. Uh, so, and since semi-join would, would be an explicit semi-join, some, some data systems support that operator. Then anti-joins just like negations for, for joins. So real queries are, are going to have a lot of this stuff in here. It, is, it isn't always going to be as clean as TPCH or even TPCDS. And so the reason why this is going to matter is that now when we start uh, enumerating different physical operators or different plan scenarios for, uh, for a SQL query, we have to take in consideration whether reordering things is actually allowed or not, whether they actually produce incorrect results. So in this example here, I'm joining uh, table A, B, and C. I do a left outer join with A and B. Then I do a full outer join with C. And so in, even though this, this is a logical plan, uh, we know from the semantics of what full outer join is going to do that we can't actually reorder this to have A join C followed by B. It has to be A, B first, then, then C. Right? And the reason is because this full outer join operator is not commutative with the left outer join. Because I don't know how I'm going to join a tuple coming out of this join with, with C until I know what b.val is. Or, like, is that that's the thing I'm joining with C on? So I'm not, not, not going to go into too much details of what's actually going here, why you can't do this. I just want to be aware that when we talk about these enforcer rules, enforcer properties, one of the th in addition to making sure the data is sort of in the right physical form, like if, if it needs to be sorted or has to be compressed a certain way, right, uh, that there also might be higher level semantics about the query that prevents us from doing one Jordan order versus another. And we have to, again, we have to implement then that in our, in our in our optimizer to, to, to you know, make sure we don't violate this. So I will say, in practice, this is going to be easier to handle in the bottoms-up approach than the top-down approach with cascades. Because in the bottoms-up approach, it's, it's, well, it's, in, it's in the next slide. We're doing generative enumer enumeration, meaning we, are, we start with nothing, and we say, OK, well, what's the next steps we could go into? What's, what's, what's the, next, you know, the, the next logical nodes I, I, I'd want to represent different joins? Join orderings. So at that step, you would know, OK, I can't, I can't flip around A, B, and C in the join order here. So I don't, I don't even generate, I don't even consider it. In the top-down approach, you just have to have additional uh, property enforcers to make sure that if I consider something, uh, sorry, if I, if I generate a, a group or expression that has, the, uh, the, has an ordering that violates this, that I, that I identify that I can't do it and I, and I, before I jump into it. This will make more sense when we talk about uh, cascades in a second, but it's just easier going from bottoms up. Yes? Uh, in this scenario, couldn't you make this C left outer join B, and then the whole thing full outer join, like essentially flip the positions of C and A in the opposition? The question is, couldn't I f flip C and A here and it would still work? Yeah. Uh, so, so here, the A ID, the A ID it goes B ID. B is going to come out, but you might not have a match. So B actually might be null when you come out of this. So you can't, join, uh, you can't join B and C because you don't know whether B.val is going to be null or not ahead of time. OK. So all right, this, this, this is sort of redundant to what I, what I just said. But like, basically, when, when the next step we're trying to do is okay, how are we going to generate or, or produce the different uh, different permutations of the plan we want to consider. I'm going to use the word permutations because it sounds like transformation, but like how we generate the different choices that we have. And in the top-down approach, it's going to be transformation, meaning we're going to take an existing plan and we're going to permute it to produce uh, more of the plan. Right? So it will, it will expand out nodes in our, in our query plan to, based on what we already have. Whereas in the bottom-up approach, the, dynamic uh, the system our dynamic programming approach, you start with nothing, and then you have some rules to say, OK, here's what I could do right now, and, and you materialize them. 
seeing a lot of blank faces. So I realize that this is, it's, it's a nuance, uh, it's a nuanced idea, but again, I think it more, make more sense when we, um, we talk about cascades. Again, it's basically how do we, how do we, how do we generate different join orderings that we can then feed into our optimizer search model to say, here's what, here's what I could, could be doing. All right, so I'm going to have one slide on the, the, the hyper approach. As I said, this, this paper is not an easy read. Um, but it's basically the, it's, a, it's an extension of the system R dynamic programming approach we talked about before, the bottoms up approach. But instead of representing all these different sort of logical nodes as being like, I'm joining this with this, you're instead going to do sort of a, a sub optimization within some hypergraph within the, the total query plan. And then you figure out how to connect those, those sort of those groups of those, of those uh, plan, or plan nodes together and then run your search on, on that. So again, th according to the, the, the literature, this is the state of the, state of the approach. This is what Hyper does. This is what Umber does. And I think this is what DuckDB does as well. But it's basically dynamic programming with a cost model, just, just as we talked about before. What I want to spend more time on is on Cascades. Uh, and as I said before, this is going to be a top-down approach. It's an extension or an improvement of the original volcano approach that I talked about last class. But the big difference is, well, one of the big differences he touted in the original paper was that it's object oriented instead of, instead of like being written C in structs uh, in, in Volcano. Um, but there's other optimizations that will go along that, that, that matter a lot. And so there's the original Cascades paper from 1995. I didn't have you guys read that because it's, it doesn't really describe it as well as I think it should. Then there's this master's thesis from a, a student in Columbia on a, on a oh, sorry, a student at Port Portland State on an optimizer they built called Columbia that I think does a better description of the of how Cascades actually works. Um, but again, the, the the Microsoft video I have you guys watch is is like here's actually how it takes take take the idea and actually implement it. So what I'll describe today is gonna be based on uh, the master's thesis because there there is there isn't much to, to go 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 on from the original paper. So this is gonna be a th the third generation uh, top down optimizer from Gertz Graphy. So there was Exodus, and then Volcano, and then, and then Cascades was the last one that he did. Um, and, th and this is what Microsoft generated. So the big idea that they're going to have is that, in, is that they're going to materialize the transformations of, of different expressions or portions of the query plan on the fly as needed as you traverse down. And this is different in Volcano, where when you land it into a group as you traverse down, you materialized everything. And your search space exploded, even though you maybe not you consider consider you know all the different paths down the tree. But in in, in cascades, they're going to have the ability to use placeholders to represent some lower portion of the tree that you haven't gone to yet, but you don't need to go to. You don't need to traverse down to, at that moment. You can you can then consider or search another place, another part of the search tree, and then you can go back to it and when when, when you're ready. And there's, there's there's other cool ideas in this as well, but like, that's sort of the big idea that you don't have to have an exhaustive uh, materialization of everything at each step along the way. All right, so there's going to be sort of four key ideas. And again, some of this, some of this is like extensions from Volcano. That some of these seem like obvious things you would do now, but again, consider where they were coming from, what they had before, that this is, this is improvements of what Volcano was doing uh, prior to this. So. The first is that they're going to represent all the optimization tasks as, 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 as these, sort of these well-defined data structures. So this being patterns that you want to match on your query plan, the rules that, that would get, then get fired to do, the, to, to do the transformation. And this is different than, again, the heuristic-based approach, where it's a bunch of if-then analysis, where like you're literally hard-coding, like, if I see my query plan looks like this uh, and has these properties, then do something. Now you define, here's the rule I want to match. And then here's you know, the pattern I'm looking for. And then here's the transformation I, I want to apply. And then you define all these together, and you just throw it to a search engine or rules engine to then do the, the recursive search and, and applies these things as needed. So the rules now are also going to declare that, also provide these property enforcers that we can specify that the, if we know that the data needs to be a certain way or in, in a certain form, uh, the, the rules engine will make sure that any 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 data coming from a, a lower portion of the subtree has to have that, those properties. 
And again, we, we can declare these things, we can define them without having to have a bunch of extra checks on the side. Yes? From an implementation standpoint, how exactly is a heuristic like an if else different from, say, pattern matching? Like, it's still trying to check if that pattern exists, right? So the statement, his question is, how is a defining a pattern different than an if then else statement? Because I can declare at a higher level like, what the pattern I want to match is, rather than like explicit code over and over again to traverse and find the thing I'm looking for. Like, so it would be, we'll see this, like, it's going to be more than just, oh, does this one node have this property? It's going to be, does a, does, a, do a node, does a node and its children have certain properties? So if you had to write that explicitly, you'd have to like, okay, if my node looks like this, then look down all the children, check whether they match, then check this. If that matches, do that. And you have to, you have to write that procedural code. Whereas I say, here's the pattern I want to look for, and then the rules engine does that traversal for you. Also, it's declarative. It's, it's meant to be declarative, yes. Yeah. All right, I'm not trying to knock on Postgres, but if you go look at the Postgres code, before you get to the cost based optimizer, you'll see a bunch of the if-then-else's uh, in the source code, because they're doing basically the same kind of pattern matching, but again, written procedural code. All right, the next big thing they're gonna have is this notion of priorities, uh, and it's gonna allow us to, to uh, define the order of how to apply transformations, and then we can adjust them on the fly as we go along, based on what we see, the, 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 how the plan is turning out, and, and based on the cost model. And the idea here is we want, we want to be able to find the, more, the optimal plans more quickly and not consider things that we know are going to be stupid or, or a waste of time. Now, in the Microsoft case, they do this with, with explicit stages where they've already hand curated, here's the things I want to consider at different stages. So you can see, think of those as sort of priorities as well, but they're not dynamically, well, they're not dynamically within one stage figuring out how to change the priority, as far as I can tell. It's when they finish the stage, then they figure out what the things, what, what, what should be the next priorities of the, of the next stage. And then the last one that is, uh, is, was a big idea as well, is that you're going to consider the predicates, uh, or, you know, the expressions and the where clauses, the join clauses, and so forth. Uh, you're going to consider them uh, as also like logical and physical operators as, along with like the things in your query plan. Now, Microsoft doesn't do this. They explicitly said this. Uh, in, in the video, but in the Cockroach DB, they, 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 they talk about these scalar expressions and they, they, they can consider them in, in the same rules engine with the same patterns as well. So basically, like the, the, the same API to write a rule that does, like, you know, flip join A, join B with, to be into join B, join A, you can also write expressions like convert, you know, one equals two into not or to, into false instead of having sort of separate stages, separate steps. Yes. So are there also like different ways of evaluating these predicates? Like you were talking in the previous uh, week about um, branch list versus like branchy. Yes. Is that something that could be like just a physical operator to the predicate? His statement, his question is like, we previously talked about how uh, when you do a sequential scan, you could have a branchless scan, a filter evaluation versus a, a, a branching evaluation. Could this also be a, uh, would this also be a physical property? No, because that would be a cost. Because the physical property is the data that's coming out of it, right, of, of, of an operator. So in both cases, this, the, in, in both the branching and the branchless sequential scan, they produce the same data in the same form. The cost would be different, though. So when you would do a logical transformation, say, scan A into branchless scan or branching scan A, those would have different costs, but they would be separate physical operators. Mm -hmm. So that's how you would account for that. There was another example in, in the Microsoft video, which I'm not going to cover because we we're focused on OLAP stuff. Um, with uh, the Halloween problem, which was, again, my mind was blown when, I, when they talked about this. Basically, you can, you can set properties in SQL Server to say, if I do some operator up above, like, like, like manipulate, like change data, could I have a lower property cause me to you know, update a tuple multiple times incorrectly? And so they would have a property enforcer to say, is this operator, is this, this portion of the query plan, is it susceptible when I do an update to, sorry, is this scan below susceptible to producing the same tuple multiple times if I update it up above, right? So the, the Halloween problem, if it, I, don't, I think I covered this in the intro class, but the Halloween problem was from IBM System R where they have a problem where you're, you're, you're doing an index scan and you're updating everyone's like salary. And you're, you, you say, find me everyone who has a salary less than $1,000 a year 
and then update them, give, you know, give them a $100 raise. So then if someone has, a, you know, their salary is $100 a year, you scan along, you find them once, you go update them, it goes back in the index now with the salary of 200, you keep scanning and you find it again, then you update it again, right? That, that's the scenario they're talking about. The reason why it's called a Halloween problem uh, has nothing to do with Halloween other than they discovered it, this problem in system R on a Friday that turned out to be Halloween, and they said, well, let's, let's not worry about this now, let's go party, and then we'll deal with it on Monday. And it's called the Halloween party. Oh, sorry, the, ha the Halloween problem. It's on Wikipedia. Okay, all right, so we have, the, okay, so we have, we have these rules, we have patterns, we can, we can change the priority of the rules as we apply them, and then we'll consider predicates as part of our uh, transformation process as well. All right, so the first thing we're gonna discuss within Cascades is this notion of expressions. Now this can be slightly confusing because I, use, I like to use the term predicate expression, you know, portions of the where clause, but in Cascades, they're, they're gonna be different than how we use them. Um, and they're gonna represent a higher level operator of, of, of some, some set of tasks or things we're going to do in our query plan that could have one or, or sorry, zero or more inputs to them, right? So an example would be if I'm joining uh, A, B, and C here, here, I can have a logical expression that says I join A and B followed by I join with C, or I can have any, any, any permutation of them. And then a physical expression would be, again, replacing the the logical operators that I'm specifying here, like scan A with sequential scan on A, the join is now a hash join, sequential scan on B or C and so forth, right? So the big thing we're gonna to need to be able to do in our optimizer is be able to identify quickly whether these, uh, that these two expressions are equivalent, right? Because we're gonna to need to know if, if, if I have this expression A join B join, join C, that when I do my transformation to a physical form so I can execute it in my, in my system, that this expression here satisfies what, what this, this logical expression needs. Right? Yes? Um, is there any particular reason that Microsoft Server, they never considered like short merge joins or they only considered like hash joins and message loops in general? Uh, the video? They said it in the video? Yeah, I, he, didn't, he never mentioned short merge. He was like, either you do a hash join or you do a message loop. He said it more as a matter of fact thing. I don't know if it was. Uh, they have merge join, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, actually, that was the Halloween problem example, right? I think like if, if you're doing a hash join in, a, in an update query, if you're on the build side, and you, say, say you have a, you know, a join B in, in your update table A. If A is on the build side, you build the hash table once, then, the, then B probes it and then, do, you know, and then goes up and does an update. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna scan A again because it's a pipeline breaker. You've generated the hash table and you're done. A nested loop draw, you may go back and, and read things, or an index scan on, on A would go back and, and do, could read the same thing over and over again. Uh, but yeah, it's, they, I'm pretty sure they have, they have merge joins. All right, so now with expressions, we're gonna combine them together into what are called groups. So group is gonna be identified by the expression that it produces as its output. And then within that, you're gonna have these unordered sets of, the, of the, 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 the logical and the physical expressions that produce that output. So in this case here, my output is I want to produce the, the combination of A, B, and C. So the logical expressions that are equivalent to it are gonna be A join B followed by join C, B join C, B join C followed by join A, and so forth here. And then the physical expressions, again, would just be all different permutations over uh, for the physical operators that represent the, the logical expressions, right? So this whole thing here, we're gonna call the group. And then these are all gonna be the equivalent expressions within that group that produce that same output here. And so these lists are gonna be unsorted sets, uh, and then the priorities that will get, the, the priorities of the transformations will get applied at runtime. So again, in Volcano, when, you, when we do a traversal and we land at a group like this, it would again materialize everything all at once and then start doing the search. In Cascades, we can iteratively start generating these, these logical, logical expressions, the physical expressions, as needed on the fly. And then, because those are done with transformation rules, and then we can have priorities in the transformation rules to say, oh, consider index scans first over, over sequential scans, or maybe do all the logical, uh, evaluate all the logical expressions before we do any of the physical expressions. Right, so there's rules like that we can apply at runtime to decide how, how we're going to materialize these. 
right? Because the reason is going to be obviously that like I'm only joining three tables here, and I'm going to have a bunch of different uh, you know permutations. But if I'm joining a lot of tables, I think they mentioned in the, in the Microsoft video they have customers have 100 they do, you know, joins on 100 tables. If you had to materialize all the different combinations for all 100 tables, this thing would explode and be massive. So another way to cut down on the on the, the expansion of these different expressions is to use what are called multi-expressions, right? And the idea here is that instead of having to, again, expand out every single uh, expression or, or subcomponent of an expression, you can represent a, a sort of multiple expressions within, within this multi-expression group. Or not, I don't use the word group. You can, multi, <laughs> you can represent multiple expressions with a multi-expression. I guess that's, uh, that's, that's stupid. Um, but one or more expressions can be combined together in a multi-expression, and then that's the placeholder to say, hey, down below me in the query plan, there's going to be a group that produces this output, in this case here, AB. I don't know what it is, but, I, but here's a placeholder for it at this point in, in, in the group. And the, and the goal here is to reduce the number of expressions that we have to consider uh, in our groups as we, as we go around, as we go down. All right? Yeah, so his question is, like, do these groups have physical properties? Yes. I'm just not, I'm just not showing them here. Right? So you would know that, okay, okay, A, B, C, and I have to be sorted on A, or in A dot, e, A dot ID or something like that. Right? So what's going to happen now as we do our search, we're going to have to expand down to the, uh, in some cases, like, like we'll get down to the, the, the leaf nodes of the, of the, of the query plan tree, uh, to figure out how we're actually going to scan all, you know, what access method we're going to use to scan the tables, and then we'll build up from there and, and, and say, what, you know, what, how we do the physical operators for the joins and other things. Right? All right, so now we have these notion of expressions, and now we can talk about how we want to define the patterns for our rules to, to do our transformations, to essentially do the expansions of, of these uh, expressions and groups. So there's going to be either a transformation rule or an implementation rule. The transformation rule is a logical, logical uh, expression, logical expression to a logical, logical expression, or the implementation rule is the logical to physical. And a rule is going to be fine of two parts. There's the pattern we're going to look for in our query plan and say, if you see this, uh, if you see this, this sort of construction or ordering of, of operators or, or, or expressions that have these certain characteristics, then, then apply some rule that defines how we want to do our, our, our substitution. So we're not going to talk about this so much, but in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the Cockroach DB optimizer, they talk about how there are some rules that you then apply where you don't care about retaining the, the plan you just had before. Like again, like stupid things like where one equals two and you convert that into where false. You don't ever. You don't need. To, you're never going to backtrack on one equals two, so you don't. You don't need to consider this. In the 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 Microsoft uh, optimizer implementation, there's that pre stage where they apply a bunch of rules without a cost model, and they know they always want to apply them, so you, you don't need to go back and backtrack and populate the memo table. So that's so sometimes will, these rules will then will update the memo table, keep track of things. Other times we just throw away where we where we came from, because we know we know we we don't need to go back. All right, so let's see an example of a rule. So this is our pattern here. That this is what we're going to look for in, in our, for this particular rule. So if we have two equijoins uh, on, on a, doing a, a, a left deep tree, uh, then we, we, if we see this pattern in our, in our query plan, we'll match on it. Now, you see here at the bottom, the leaf nodes, group one, group two, group three, these are placeholders, right? This is saying the rule doesn't care what's below this. All we care about is we have an equijoin, equijoin feeding into another equijoin like this, All right? So if our plan looks like this, uh, this would actually match because again we would have two. Uh, we have an expression here to do a join A and B, and then we have a, another expression here to do that takes the output of A and B put together, uh, and then joins it uh, with C. So in this case here, again, th this rule would match this pattern like this. So we can have a transformation rule that just converts it to a uh, from from left to a left left deep tree to a right deep tree. 
So now we're going to join B and C first, and then join the output of that into with A. Or we're going to have an implementation rule where we convert the, the logical plan nodes to say how we're going to do the join into a physical plan nodes to say, I'm going to use a sort merge join for this and a sort merge join for that. Right? So what's one obvious problem with, with this sort of pattern matching approach? We have a lot of patterns. That's one. Yes. But uh, we're, we're, we're use heuristics to try to cut that down. Yes. It's not dynamic to workloads. It's not dynamic to workloads. What do you mean? Like, if you're gonna have some state that's the same as this in the placeholder, is that you can't solve it? Anymore? So you're saying you, so like with 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 the leaf nodes here, you get to see what they are first, yeah. but you don't care at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the I, I, I mean, I was, the obvious problem is that I could get stuck in an infinite loop, right? So I'm going to have a transformation rule that goes left to right. I could have another transformation rule that goes right to left. Then what happens? I, I go, then I fire the same pattern again and, and over and over again. And you don't want to have to maintain state, like, for each individual rule, did I apply it at this portion of the tree? Because it may be the case, I mean, left to right, right to left, that's obvious to be one after another. But it may be a series of transformations that I apply and then that same thing gets, gets triggered again, and I'm, I'm back in my loop. And so I don't want to have to maintain the state of where I'm going you know, as I traverse down the tree over and over again. So the way we're going to handle this problem is to rely on the memo table. So again, I realized that in the Microsoft uh, video, they were, they were discussing this without describing it. So now, now we'll go through what it is. So I think in the original Cascades paper, they, they refer to this as being like a graph data structure. In our implementation, uh, when we were building a Cascades optimizer here, we used a hash table. I think in everyone else, uh, all the other implementations that are open source, they're using hash tables. And so the idea with this is that it's going to be a table that's going to keep track of the, the, the best plan or, or expression we've seen for a given output of, of a group, along with its cost. And the idea here is that as we traverse down, if we see that we need to get a cost of something below us in the tree, and we know, and we know what the output is because we know what the expression is before we go down, we can look in our memo table and say, have we already done this? If yes, then we just reuse that cost and we're done. So going back to my example of going left to right, right to left, if the, if the rule matched, uh, we, would, we would then see, if the rule got matched, we'd then see, oh, we've already done this transformation before, because we would see the, the, the equivalent cost in our query plan, or sorry, in our memo table, and we would know we don't need to traverse down into it and consider it again. So this can help us do du duplication detection uh, and if, you know, keep track of the cost and construct it, uh, the final outcome of, of, the, of the cost of the query plan, and keep track of what properties are being, you know, make sure that the properties are not being violated as, as we go along. So it's sort of like an overview table of here's everything that's going on as, as we do our uh, traversal. So not to go too, too theoretical on you, but the, the basic premise of how this is going to work is using this notion of the principal optimality. And it basically just means that we're doing a branch and bound search in Cascades as we expand out and look for query plans. And if we know that if we have the best plan we've seen so far at some point in the tree, if the next thing we could potentially consider going down to the tree already produces a higher cost than the best plan we've ever seen before, we know there isn't some magic way for that plan to go then, going down that, that branch of the tree to magically get better than the best plan we've seen before, because the costs are cumulative. Right? It's just saying that we see something here, we see something in a query plan uh, at, at some level, at the, and the next step is worse than the best we've seen so far. We can stop. We don't need to consider it any further. Right? It's the, the basic notion of, of a branch inbound. All right, so here's, here's zero search now. Or, sorry, let's see how we, we construct a query plan uh, for A join B join C using the memo table and our groups of multi expressions. So, this is, the, this is the, again, this, in, in top down search, you start with the outcome you want. My output is A join B join C. So, th this is the outcome we want, and we want to traverse down and figure out what, what should our physical plan be. And our memo table on the side here, for simplicity, I'm only going to show for each output here's the best expression I've seen so far. And with its cost. So that I know that when I go, if I, if I traverse down at some point and I have to get the cost of an expression below me 
in, in my query plan. If I have it, have it in the memo table, then, then I, I can stop at that point and, and I don't have to go down and do it. All right, so say the first transformation rule we would have is to convert the, what, the output we want into so a, a logical expression here. So A, B with a join on C. So now I, would, I could have a transformation rule that says, OK, well, I want to learn more about the cost of joining A and B. So I would have another group down here where the output is just A and B. And then the same thing. I can now do a logical, uh, join the logical multi-expression with, with A join B. And the brackets again mean this is the output that I want. So at this point here, I don't know how I'm going to scan A. I don't know how I'm going to scan B. I don't know how I'm going to join B, but I know A will be the, inner, the outer and B is the inner, inner table. So now I can expand down here and get down to the, the group that's just the output of A. There's only one logical expression for this example. It's what you say for, for our purposes is get A. Right? So then we can apply transformation rules that converts this into physical multi-expressions. So sequential scan on A or an index scan on A. So let's just say for this example here, for whatever reason, this table, the sequential scan is the cheaper one. It has a cost of 10. So we update now our memo table and say, OK, for a, the group that produces the output of A, the best physical expression we've seen for so far is sequential scan on A and has this cost. So then now I come back up to uh, this, this node here, this group, and now I need to get the cost of B. Same thing, traverse down here, only one logical expression, to apply the transformation rule that generates index scan or sequential scan. In this case here, the sequential scan is still cheaper. And so that's 20, and then we update our memo table like this. So now, now I come back up to this point here. And I can keep applying different logical expressions, uh, transformations to try different join orders. But in this case here, B join A. When I go say, what's the cost of scanning A? These lines are, should be flipped. I go scan the cost of A, go sc the cost of scanning B. I look at my memo table, and I have those results. So I don't actually don't even need to do that traversal. I just say, OK, I got it. We're good. I know what this is going to cost, and I'm done. So now I apply transformation rules uh, to, to try to different join algorithms to join A and B. Right, because it's A join B, it's either A join B or B join A. There's no other logical transformation you can do here. So now we want to consider physical transformations. So again, same thing. I have these these placeholders for the for the, the groups that represent get A, get B, and I can use my my memo table to say, okay, I know what the cost of those, and I'm done. And so I'm really now costing the the hash join here, or sorry, the, the join algorithm. And let's say that the sort merge join is is the fastest. The best one with the lowest cost. And again, th these numbers are synthetic, it's not real. Yes? Uh, in practice, uh, for the uh, A join B or B join A, like when, I, when we go get to the point B join A, we don't need to actually uh, like further look into getting that result. You, 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 you mean, why you, are you still so, when you, so at this point here, yeah, yeah, yeah. like instead of going down and computing, recomputing the cost here, Yeah, so the statement is, at this point here, like, I was saying, like, you, you would know B join A is equivalent with A join B at the, the logical level. So you don't need to traverse down to the groups and get their costs. You just look at the memo table and say, I know what the cost is. At your point, you can say, OK, well, well, the cost would be A, cost 10 plus cost 20 is this, is this two skins on this. Yeah, so these, these are equivalent, so they have the same cost. Yes? Yes? Oh, yeah. so Wait, sorry, you don't think so? If it's a hash join, and you, you're not there yet. This is logical. Right? So I'm not even saying I'm doing a hash join. So like, again, this is that principle of optimality. At this point, I have a cost uh, that is scan A plus scan B. Let's say here my cost is 30. If I have some other best plan somewhere with a cost of 10, then I know that no matter what join algorithm I'm going to use, I'm not going to be able to get my cost down below 30. So I, I can stop here and, and go back up. At this point here, he's just saying that, like, OK, A join B, B join A, they have the same cost, ignoring the, the, the join algorithm. So I can either look at my memo table. Well, in your case, like, you could have a memo table entry to say, like, what's the cost of A, B? And then you would know you need a way to then say B join A is equivalent to A join B when you do your lookup. So that's really how you, it, it, it all depends on how efficient you want, your, you want your, your, your memo table to be. For our purposes, I'm really being really stupid and just saying, OK, 
just like just looking at the individual like scan operators and the, and the outputs here. But you could have for individual entries uh, another cost or another entry for every multi-expression within the logical level. You could have another entry in the, in the memo table. Uh, the problem is that this thing gets get, would get too big on PowerPoint. All right, so now again, at primary transformation rules, they convert the logical multi-expression, so A join B, B join A, into different uh, uh, physical operators with, 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 you know, for the physical, physical join algorithms. And again, I don't have to go down get the cost of, of accessing B and A. I have that from my memo table here. So now, the, the cost of, of this group, A, B, of producing the output of A, A, B, A join B, is going to be the cost of the, the accessing A and B separately plus the cost of the join. Again, synthetic number, I'm saying 50. It's the, the sum of them, and that's what gets populated in my, in my memo table here. So now I pop up, back up to my, my root node. Now I want to go down the C side. All right, same thing. At this point here, I got to get the, the cost of accessing C. I, the index stand is the cheapest. That goes in the memo table. And then now I want to apply a bunch of different transformation rules for you know, changing the different join orders in my, in my root or the different physical ordering. And say I, I find something that's the optimal plan from this, uh, and that, that's what gets put into my, to my memo table. And at this point, I'm done. Right? I'm obviously skipping a lot of steps because like, there's a bunch of different join order orders I, I could consider, but for the sake of time in PowerPoint, I'm not, I'm not expanding it out. You basically do all the same steps for all the join orders you want, you want to consider. Yes? What about the interesting order idea? So for instance, like, suppose that the index scan produces something in the order from E that you want to do as join off. You can exploit that order and do a knowledge join. Yes, so his statement is, um, like, how would, how would you consider the case where the yeah, like, like if, if you're doing index scan and you have an index on the join key uh, for both tables, how would you then be able to consider when you come back up, like this is, like, like you now do a certain merge join. So it's sort of like the dynamic programming thing. You can't guarantee you're going to find the optimal plan. Right? You'd have to sort of, you, you'd have to sort of seed it to consider, okay, let me try the index scan now uh, for a, let me try the index scan now for, for this, for this, this these, these, accessing these two tables. Because then that will feed into my, my server join. You'd have to sort of set up the transformation rules that allow you to do that. I don't know. I don't know whether you're allowed to go back and, and say, okay, well, look, even though I already have this cached, let me let me go back and cost this again, right? I, I don't think. I'm, I'm sure you could, but I don't think you, they actually do that. Is that where the properties come in? So the, you have one which has the property where it's coming out slower, and one which has that property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's right. Yeah. So in that, yeah. So. If you have a sort merge join, and so in the case of like I think SQL Server, like Postgres has this too. There's the, there's they call it a merge join. So they, they assume the data is coming into it sorted. So the property be the data has to be sorted. So when you, if you then consider a sort merge join here in, in your physical operators, you would then say, okay, is the does the thing feeding into me like say on the on C side, is that sorted on the thing I want? If no, then I can go back and get a new cost. And I would have a different entry for in my memo table because the properties now could potentially be different. So that, that's how he would you he, he would handle that. So you, you could revisit C uh, because now you care about a property that, that maybe the previous one didn't have. But that was okay when you you were considering hash joins first or something. Right. And so going back down to the priority stuff, it almost always is the case as we talked about before that hash joins always gonna be faster. So you could then set it so your priorities to consider hash joins first. See whether you do okay, but how well you do, and then if you have more time, go try a sort merge join. So let's just say that Umber doesn't have sort merge joins, right? That's that according according to Thomas. That's what he said. Right. Does that make it faster to do query optimization? So his, his statement is: if your system doesn't have sort merge join, does that make it faster to do query optimization? Yeah, because it's one less thing you have to consider. Absolutely, yes. Um, Right, the more, the more, I mean, sensory, the more features you have in your, in that your data system could, could use, or for, you know, for your, your different choices of physical operators, like in your example, like branching versus branchless, you can do it, but now it's, it just, it's, it's exploding the search, which may or may not be a good idea. 
Yes. So in my example here, I'm showing you like, the groups as, as like a separate thing. The memo table and the groups are, are the, like, they're basically the same thing. So like, right? And so you could represent the groups within this hash table that like, yeah, so in that case, like you, you, you could still, like in that case, you, within the group in the memo table, you would have, here's the things I've traded before and here's their cost. So, you, so like in this case here, the index scan was slower than the sequential scan, but I could still, if I computed the cost, I could still keep it. And that would, that would be in the memo table. Sorry, the word algorithm, sorry? Like the, the Dijkstra one. Oh, the Dijkstra one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, you could. I, I, don't, I don't know if they actually do that, though. Yeah. OK. So we covered this last class of like, how do we decide when to stop here? Um, in the case, because you know, we, just, we could just do this forever. In the case of the dynamic appro programming approach, like, you got to like you got to get to the end at some point, uh, and so you could use heuristics to cut, cut things off instead of trying to do more exhaustive search. But if you start doing it in that stages, you have to do all the stages until you get to the end. Um, in this approach here, like once we have, once we reach, reach a the leaf nodes for all the, the 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 tables we want to scan, and we have physical we have a complete physical plan, we're done. We we, we could say okay, we can run this run this plan right now. It may not be the best one. But like, we, if we're out of time, we, we got to run it, right? So the most obvious way to decide when to stop is, is we, we need to exhaust all possible transformations. Um, the other one we talked about, too, is like you say, OK, I'm going to run for a certain amount of time. Uh, and then when I'm done, I'm done. I think MySQL works this way. The thing that came out of the Microsoft one that was, I found interesting was they don't base the termination on the, on the, amount, of, like, the amount of time you've spent. They base it on the number of transformations you've applied. And the idea here is that if your system's overloaded, it's going to be slower at applying these transformations because you've got to go to the cost model, you've got to, you know, you got to go in the catalog, it gets expensive. So if your system's overloaded, if you're based on wall clock time, then since the transformations are slower, I'm going to end up with a crappier plan because everything just took longer. But if you base it on the logical, the logical count of the number of trans transformations that you applied, then no matter whether the system's overall or not, you're going to generate roughly the same quality of the query plan. So I thought that was a really good idea, and it's not something I, I you know, I, I thought about before before Microsoft mentioned it. That like they care about again plan stability, no matter whether the system's overloaded or not. And the last one again is a cost threshold that basically says if I have exceeded some threshold or if I, if I have a query plan that's better than some threshold I set before, um, it could be like here's the best plan I see initially, and if I find one that's 10% better, then I'll, then I'll stop. Right? It could be based on the cost estimates you're getting back from the, from the system itself. So this is an incomplete list of a bunch of different um, uh, cascade implementations. So actually, CalSight might, might be wrong. I need to double check on that, because um, they claim they're based on Volcano. Right? So again, there's the Cascades paper, but then that came out in 95. Gertz, Gertz, Microsoft hired the Gertz Graphy guy that invented Cascades immediately to go build Cascades in, 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 in SQL Server when they did the major rewrite uh, in the 90s. So there wasn't an academic version of Cascades until uh, Op++ and Columbia came along in the 90s. The code is, both these systems are, or frameworks are still there, but it's like old C++ code that, I, who knows, it probably doesn't even compile. Uh, At least it's C++. Goes what? As opposed, as opposed to what, C? Yeah. So, and then there's Greenplum, Orca, and CalSight we'll talk about in a second. Um, I guess I, I don't think CalSight is truly cascaded, but SQL Server, we, we've talked about before. We'll go a little bit into detail. Tandem Nonstop SQL was a, um, Tandem was a, a hardware company in the late 70s, 80s, that was building this like super redundant hardware. Like think of like, like space shuttle kind of computers where you have like three, three CPUs computing the same thing and you see what produces the right result. And so they, they made a database system with Jim Gray when he left IBM. Uh, he was contractually obligated not to build another database system for a certain amount of time. So he was at Tandem working on like fault tolerance stuff. And then they, they got him to build a, start, you know, work on nonstop SQL to build a new, new database system. Um, 
This got bought by, I think, DEC. The grant DEC got bought by Compaq, and it got bought by HP. So this is still around. This, a lot of banks still use this. Um, but it's, it's more or less a maintenance mode at this point. Clustrix was a, um, a distributed version of MySQL that got spun out of AOL. If, America Online was a, the big internet company in the, in the US in the late 90s. Um, and they got bought by um, uh, the MariaDB guys uh, a few years ago. And the CockroachDB we'll talk about a little bit as well. Um, and they did, a, they wrote, there was some scratch. Uh, for Clustrix, there isn't much documentation that says like, what it actually does. If you read, I, I actually don't know if their documentation is still around. Uh, it might be taken offline when they got sold. But they, they, had this, they had this optimizer called Sierra or something. And they, they have one line that mentions cascades. That we're, we're doing cascades. But there's, there's no details of how they actually do it. All right, so I want to go through uh, these five rule implementations, just go into more detail, like, uh, roughly what they're doing. And I said, as far as I can tell, these are the ones that are doing, uh, are using cascades. Calcite is questionable. Single store is going to be, it's going to be bottoms up. Again, I'm just going to go through how to high level what each of them are doing. The SQL Server one is probably the most interesting. Again, why, how do you guys watch the video? So it's the first cascades implementation that, 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 ever, that ever existed that they started in 1985, because again, Microsoft hired the author of Cascades. And it's been used as or either the original Cascades implementation that was in SQL Server, or some derivative of it has been used now in a bunch of different Microsoft database products. Right? They talk, I think Cosmos DB uses this. Uh, there's the, the cloud version of, of, of SQL Server, that, called Azure SQL, that uses it. There's another internal system called Scope, which sort of looks like BigQuery that uses it. Um, so it's, it's been using a bunch of different things at, at, at Microsoft. Uh, all the transformations are written in C++ instead of a, a DSL, like in the original Cascades paper or the CockroachDB approach. Um, and then all the predicate transformations <coughs> will be written as sort of separate procedural code with rules and not integrated as part of the, the transformation engine, the rule engine, uh, like, the, like the paper specified. And they said this for, uh, in, in the talk they talk about, they mentioned like the reason why they don't do DSL is because at some point, you're going to have to examine the state of the query plan and start doing more complex analysis and transformations. And that writing in a DSL just makes it almost look like C++ anyway. So they, they wrote it in C++. And we'll see in the camp example of um, in CockroachDB, you can write their, their DSL allows you to write Go functions or make call to Go directly in it, even though it's associated with a higher level language. So the big thing that, that, that I want you to get out of the, 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 the the video is that the way that they're going to apply these rules isn't like I showed in my example before, where everything's all being done within sort of one pass or one, one traversal of the query plan. Instead, they're going to apply things on stages where they're going to increase the, the scope of what they can optimize and the complexity of the transformations that they're, they're applying as you get further along in, 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 the, in the, the optimization pipeline. And the idea here is similar to the stratified approach where there's rules that, in the beginning, you know you're always going to want to apply, so you don't even need to fire up the rule engine for this. You just go ahead and apply them, like predicate pushdowns and other things. And then as you get to the cost-based search, the, the idea is that at each stage, you sort of sub-stage within the pipeline, you look at the best plan that comes out of it and, and, the, and the sort of cost estimates, and then they decide whether you can even continue with doing more robust or more complex optimizations because it may be the plan is just good enough and it's not worth doing additional search, just run the query because it's so simple. Or decide whether to do the, the, the full search. So in the first step, they're doing the simplification of the normalization. So this would be doing tree-to-tree -tree transformations, essentially applying the rules that, that, that I talked about before, like, that you, you know you're always going to want to do. And the key thing about this is that unlike in, the, in a stratified search where you would have sort of separate code to do the, the, the heuristics and separate code to do the cost-based search, it's the same rules, the same patterns, and same code base that applies these rules to, that you don't, don't require a cost model. It, you run basically the same rules engine without doing the cost-based search. So it's not like, so you could have some rules that, that would used to be only in the cost-based search. You could then now apply them to in this, this first stage here. So predicate pushdown we talked about, converting outer joins to inner joins, of course. Uh, Subquery removal, if possible, um, which is, in Microsoft's case, not, they can't always do. And then empty result pruning, like if I'm joining, if one table is empty and I'm joining with it, I know it's not going to produce any results. 
and therefore I, I can you know, propagate the joint, uh, propagate the empty result to everyone else. So this is we do in tree to tree transformations. Again, just applying our pattern, uh, matching our patterns, applying our rules. Then you do a pre explanation and this is now this is not actually going to be uh, applying transformation rules, but this is setting up the metadata or the information we need to then do the call space search. So. Uh, this, this is sort of a rule. But they, they have code that looks for, if, if your query is super simple, like select star from table on a primary key, you have the primary key index. Like you don't need to do any additional planning. You search, search, short circuit the search right there and stop there. The one thing that is very interesting that they talk about is they look at the query plan, they figure out what statistics I'm going to need based on what columns are accessing either the join clauses, the where clauses, and so forth. And then they go check the catalog to see whether they have that, that, that those statistics ready or not. If they don't, they block the, the, the query optimizer, go do like the, you know, analyze or do some sampling on, on, on the table you're going to access to then build that statistics and then come back and actually start doing the query planning again. Right? This is super fascinating because uh, most systems don't work this way. Right? If you don't have good statistics on Postgres, Postgres doesn't care. It just runs whatever it has. Right? It doesn't tell you, oh, you're missing this. You, you should really go get it. They'll stop and go get it. And so what's interesting is that this will make the first query that you hit without statistics is going to suck, but then everything else after that should be OK. Obviously, there's other triggers you can do. Like if you bulk insert into a table, uh, you know, the data system should identify, oh, I just bulk inserted. Let me go run analyze immediately before I run any queries. Uh, SQL Server can do that. Oracle can do that. Uh, Postgres doesn't do, doesn't do that, I don't think. Uh, and then they, so, so once they get this, uh, all the stats, they do some initial cardinality estimates. Uh, you can do some potential joint collapsing. Right, so th these would be transformation rules. These, these, are, these obviously aren't transformation rules. They're just things that get triggered to set things up. Then you get into the exploration phase, the call space search. And this is the cascades portion that we've, that we've talked about before. That's the tree traversal with the memo, the, mem the, memo, the memo table. And so what they're going to do is, is, is in three stages, where they're going to apply in stage one after another, and then again, when they look at the when they take the output of one stage, they, again they check to see whether uh, the plan they have already is good enough. If yes, then they'll stop and not go to the next stage. Otherwise, then they'll they'll, they'll expand and go to it. They also talked about how they can sound like they can dynamically also decide what transformation rules to consider at the next stage based on what they think the query looks like. So, for example, if you're not doing anything that looks like a CTE then don't even bother triggering or setting up things that optimize CTE queries. Right? And then that just makes everything run faster. And so there's the, the trivia plan. It's sort of a more aggressive short circuiting, short circuiting than what you do here. Then a quick plan would be like for OHB queries or simple like two table joins. But if you have a lot of joins and more complex things, then you get to the third stage and you, you do a more exhaustive search. The second stage and the, and the, and the third stage can run, run in parallel, whereas the, the first stage is just a single thread doing this. And then the last stage is uh, what they call the post optimization uh, or, or engine specific transformations. And again, this is, this is what I was saying before where it's, they, they reuse the Cascades optimizer from SQL Server in a bunch of different products at Microsoft. And so all of this part is the same from those systems. But then this last step here, you can tack on things to make it do whatever, whatever the engine wants to do. So they talk about how in um, for the parallel data warehouse version of, of SQL Server, they will generate this query plan, and then this thing will do some final work to chop it up to make it, make it be a distributed query. So the two optimizations that I think are really interesting that, that they talk about, uh, one are the timeouts based on the, the logical counts. That one we've already talked about. But then they also talked about how this memo table is a way to sort of initialize the search with things that, 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 that we know as humans, since we build the data system, that we know we're going to want to start with to get as close to what we think the optimal plan is. Right? So again, in my example before, when I showed you know, doing the, the top-down search, the memo table is empty, or all the group expressions were all empty. Uh, and then I, I said there's some transformation rules we apply based on some priority, to then filled out what we actually want to do. So it's that population of the group expressions, uh, if, if we choose things at the very beginning that we think are going to be a good idea, then that could allow us to maybe find the, in the near optimal plan in our allotted time. So they talk about how they have 
since they have the Cardinelli estimates that came out in the previous stage, they can use that to figure out, here's the joint order I think I'm going to want to do. And you examine that first. Or they do what the Oracle, the, the Oracle way is, assume that the human has maybe put the, the tables in the order that they wanted to join them with when they wrote the query, and consider that be the join ordering, one of the join order, orderings you consider first, instead of some, some random jumbled up thing. And in practice, they say, again, you this is all heuristics. You can't guarantee you're going to find the optimal plan for any possible query. But in the real world, in databases, we, we care about constant times, and that this might, you know, this might be good enough for what we need. OK? All right, so the next one is Calcite. So this is an open source project. It's a standalone query optimizer as a service. Uh, it's written in Java. And the idea here is that, again, instead of every, every data system having to re-implement their own query SQL parser and, and you know, the, the transformation rules and all that, that you'd have a single service that could then speak a bunch of different SQL dialects, knows how to put it down into a canonical form or internal representation, and does the transformation on those and produces out some physical plan for you that, that you can run. Um, so this is originally part of a, a, a open source database system that also was a company called LucidDB. Who here has heard of LucidDB? Nobody, of course, yes. Uh, it's dead. Uh, but they, for whatever, it, I think it was a, it's a European academic project and maybe a startup, but then they, they took out the, 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 the optimizer service or, or, or sort of framework they built for LucidDB and then rewrote it or extracted it out and then made it its own standalone thing called Calcite. Um, is from Hive. Is it from Hive? Yeah. Well, Hive uses it. <coughs> we'll double check. Anyways. We'll double check. Um, so there's a bunch of systems that use this. Uh, Flink uses this. HeavyDB, which used to be Omnicide, uses this. Splice Machine is using this. Hive uses this. Um, the, uh, a lot of people use it just for the SQL parser. Like you don't have to use the full thing. Uh, you can just use it for the SQL parser. You can use it to do the query optimization stuff. But you have, again, it's outside your database system, so you have to implement their API to say, hey, you know, here's my cost model estimates for, this, for these operators. Like you have to implement the, the, all the things that SQL Server was calling internally. You have to expose that in your system if you want to take, take advantage of this. So get, using it as a full query optimizer, I think, is, is non-trivial. Another, another sort of standalone service is this thing called uh, Orca from Greenplum. So this is originally built by Pivotal, as we I think we discussed. Pivotal got bought by EMC, or, and, and, and then it got spun out. Now VMware owns it. Um, so this was a standalone Cascades implementation in C++. Uh, it was originally written for Greenplum, uh, but they also added support for Hawk, which is their, it was their version of Hive, like SQL on top of uh, MapReduce or HDFS. Um, the idea is, again, instead of having to re-implement your own query optimizer for these different systems, you have one standalone thing that can support both of them. Uh, but Greenplum is the main user at this point. So we looked at this when we were trying to build our own system before. When we looked at it at first, there was no documentation. It was just like a bunch of example XML files that you have to upload and, and to use it. Um, it's, it's, uh, since then, they have better documentation. I don't know of anybody else using it outside of Greenplum. But they're actively maintaining it, and it looks, it looks pretty good. And it supports multi-threaded search. So, in the original uh, Orca paper, they talk about some interesting things that I think are worth considering when you build an optimizer. Now, this is less, the first one is less of an issue if you're a cloud-based system. The second one still matters uh, for, for no matter whether you're cloud or not. So the first issue they had to deal with was if people are running this on-prem and there's a bug and something crashes, how do you figure out why the optimizer failed or why the optimizer produces a bad query plan? And so what they talk about is that they would ha if, it, if, if the query crashed, they could basically dump out the state of the memo table, which would, not, which would be big, and then ship that as a binary back to the developers at the company, and they can use that to recreate what was the search state of the, of the optimizer when it was trying to, find, uh, you know, trying to find a plan. Again, the cloud makes this unnecessary because if you're hosting the system for people, you have access to everything. Um, but there, there are, some, there are some, still some useful ideas out of this. The, the next one is how they do testing for this. Um, how to actually check to see whether your, op your optimizer is producing, uh, producing the right plan based on the, the estimated cost. And what they talk about is how they would do, uh, 
when they do testing with fuzzing, that they would they would generate the you know they would run a SQL query through the optimizer. They would take the best plan and the second best plan, run both of them, and then see whether they were actually truly ranked in that order correctly, or, or the, maybe the top ten or so. And that allowed them to iteratively figure out you know how to improve the cost model estimates, improve the optimizer, to, so that the that the, the estimates were matching up with the actual runtime cost. Cockroach DB has a cascade implement, uh, implemented their own cascade optimizer starting in 2018, uh, and everything's in Go. And so they're using their own DSL called OpGen that you would write in this higher level language. Here are the transformations I want to do, and then do the CoGen that into uh, to, to, to Go, because um, the whole system is written in Go. Unlike in, in SQL Server, they're going to consider the scalar expressions, the predicates within where clauses, as transformation rules as well, along with operator transformations. So this is from a uh, talk that Becca gave, Becca Tapp gave uh, during the pandemic. But this is just an example of what their, their opt-in language looks like. So this is a rule to do, if someone has in a where clause, where not not true, right? You can, you can get rid of the, the, the double nots, right? So it's, you know, it's a bit inscrutable, but that's, you know, you, this is what a rule and, and, and transformation would actually look like. All right, the last one is going to be SQL Store, um, previously called MemSQL. Um, so they're doing, this is a distributed query optimizer based on a stratified approach, doing, doing bottom-up search. Um, and so they have sort of the, the, the standard stages, the rewriting stage, your logical of transformations, logical fitter transformations, and do join order. But the one thing they have is very interesting that we, we haven't seen in other systems, is that after they get out the physical plans from the enumerator, they then convert those physical plans back into SQL. And then they send the SQL queries to the executor nodes, who then do all this stuff all over again, like parse it, plan it, and optimize it. Right? So it looks like this. SQL query shows up, parser, planner, or sorry, the, 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 parser, a binder, rewriter, physical plan, and then now you send the SQL query to the different execution nodes, who are then going to do all these same steps again. And we take a guess why. Is it engineering debt? Is it engineering debt? Yeah, so he basically said yes. So he, he said that, that each executor, could, since it's getting a SQL query, the, the SQL query is also annotated with information like where to send the data to, like between different nodes. Like it's it's not pure it's not like it's not SQL the client would send they put some extra stuff in it but that's for internal uh, internal bookkeeping and data movement but the reason why they do it is that all the executor nodes are going to have their own statistics about what the data looks like locally so if you're given a SQL query they can decide how they act, what the the best way to actually run it is right this thing is saying okay I know what my global cluster looks like for all my data I know how to chop the query up and send it to different pieces different different locations. But how each node is actually going to do the, the, the physical execution of whatever the scan I'm asking them to do, they can decide locally. Because they, the, the idea is that they see the data, they know what it looks like, and therefore they're, they're in the best position to make, make, make this decision. Yes? Is the data distributed across different No question. Is the data distributed across different nodes? Yes. So, so this would be in their shared nothing on-prem system. I, I, I think they still do this. Um, but you can imagine some of the, we've talked about doing like object stores stuff. In that case, you know, there's, the, there's distributed S3, then there's all these compute nodes. This wouldn't be a good use of that because everybody sees all the same data anyway, right? Um, but all, not all query plans can be converted back to SQL. Like if you generate something like a group by call plan, there's no SQL which can easily. So his statement is if you do a, a group by with a top end, there's no way to convert that physical plan back to SQL. This is what they claim to do. It's in the paper. I don't know. This is, I think, this is 2017, DLDB. So, all right. So, uh, again, hopefully this is going to be a crash course on what you know, the Cascades query optimizer looks like. We, we talked about the dynamic stuff last class. Um, hopefully the, the main impression you're getting from all of this is that it's hard, very, very hard. Do you have a question? Sorry. No. Okay. Uh, and again, this is, as I said before, this is why people build the heuristic-based stuff first, or the NoSQL guys say, we're not going to do SQL at all, because you have to build a query optimizer, right? This is, nobody wanted to, like, this is very, very hard to do. 
the Microsoft, all the major companies have spent millions and millions of dollars to try to make these things be as efficient as possible. Uh, and, and even then, it was, we'll see the paper guys in next class, they, they get things wrong. Um, and I don't think machine learning is a magic wand that's going to just solve all, all these problems. So at the end of the day, though, all these algorithms are all going to rely on having the cost model. And that's the thing we'll cover next class, how you actually figure out, OK, well, what, what is the estimated cost? Or what, of, of what's the selectivity of these predicates on, on, this, on, these, uh, on these scans? OK? All right, guys. Enjoy your weekend. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Oh <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the S D Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I could do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so you am a fool cause I drink fruit. Quick the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central, G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12-pack case of a 40. A six-pack 40 act gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>